On January 25th, 2021, at 5.21 p.m., I received this text from an AI platform that detects breaking events and sends alerts to first responders so they can respond to emergencies faster and save lives. I immediately noticed that this emergency was in my mom's building or near her building. So I frantically called her to make sure that she was okay, and I asked her to either stay in her apartment or leave the area. What did she do? Instead of staying in the apartment and running away from danger, she went right towards it. A friend of mine who lived in her building sent me this photograph a few minutes later. It happens. Although we rarely encounter high-stakes events in making those decisions, it turns out that all of us make decisions every single day based on AI, either on information that AI gives us or AI makes the decisions for us. Think for a second about what you did today. You probably checked your social media, you used maps to get from A to B, maybe you used a dating app. And it's amazing, it's incredible. Many of those decisions are inconsequential, almost automatic, we don't think about them, we just do them. But some of them are really, really impactful and they create miracles, they can change your life. I actually met my wife thanks to AI. So I have a lot of things to thank AI for. AI saw something in me that no one else had and that she's still trying to find. We're really going through a historical moment. It's a major, major change in humanity. And the reason is really, really simple. I want you to think about this for a second. It's the first time in history that we're delegating decisions to technology at scale. First time in history that we do this at scale. And it's the first time in history that AI is generating content that is indistinguishable from human creations at scale. This has huge implications across the board. And it's very, very challenging because it creates a lot of questions. How much control do we want to cede to these AI systems or to whom? Who's controlling these AI systems? What decisions should we make? How much attention should we pay in, in making decisions based on this information that AI is providing or allow AI to decide for us? They're really, really hard questions. The truth is, they're hard, and there's only one option. And the option is that we have to get better. As AI gets better and improves, we have to get better. So the question is, how do we get better? How do we deal with all of this stuff happening around us that is influencing how we interact with the world as a whole, how we interact with each other? Well, the last few years, I've been working on building AI for emergency response, and I've discovered patterns that I've put into what I call the critical AI thinking wheel. The basic idea is you get the information, you question that information, right? You gather evidence of whatever it is that you're seeing, you consider the alternatives, and you go back and question it again. So you do this cycle, it's a loop. And it's really important that you do this because this determines the quality of the decisions that you make. Now, the next question is, well, when do you do this? Do you do this all the time? No. We make decisions constantly, right? Every time we cross the street. Yeah, you cross the street, you probably want to make sure you look at the light and you, and you do the right things. AI plays basically three roles in decision making. The first one is what I would call automatic. So the human takes an automatic action. The AI is autonomous. So we fully delegate the decision to AI. AI makes the decision and does it. Examples of this include robot vacuums and in the future self-driving cars, right? You just press a button, they do it. We don't need to worry about it. They decide they do it. So in this category, it's fast, no wheel needed, we just let them take care of it. The second category is semi-automatic. In this category, AI tells us, gives us information, and we act based on that information. The best example of this is maps. You enter a location on your GPS, you get in your car, you drive. It doesn't always work. Raise your hand if you've ever gotten lost using your GPS. I'm sure many of us have done it. Here's a good example. This particular individual was visiting Iceland. He typed in the name of the city. The drive was about 45 minutes. He ended up driving for six hours in icy roads. He got completely lost, became sort of famous in Iceland for doing that. Even in the second case, we have to pay attention, right? The consequence here wasn't that great. But the point is, you have to put your hand on the wheel sometimes. 
The third category is supportive. In the supportive category, we receive information from AI, and then we act. Examples of this include when we're selecting restaurants, right? We make a decision, but it's based on recommendations from AI systems. Products that we buy, healthcare, a lot of thought has to go into any healthcare decisions that we make. Voting, and this one is particularly interesting because it's not necessarily one piece of information, it's the accumulation of many small pieces of information. So it's almost like a diet. Every little thing that we consume is having an influence, so we have to pay attention constantly. It's not just for one thing, one big thing, it's every little thing. In a large-scale emergency, in an emergency situation, you get a lot of content coming in, a lot of information very, very quickly, and you have to analyze every single one of those pieces of information to be able to act and save lives. This third category, again, provides information. We act on it. We need both hands on the wheel. We really need to pay attention. So the question is, how do you decide when you put your hands on the wheel, when you let the autonomous AI do the driving, or when you do something in between? And it really comes down to cost. So if you're a company, you have to think about the cost of the errors, not the cost of implementing. But how much are the errors going to cost if you make a mistake? If you make a mistake and drive for six hours instead of 45 minutes, okay, maybe it's not a big deal. If you have a robot vacuum and you have a dog that doesn't behave well, and the robot vacuum doesn't have a poop detector, and you don't supervise it, that could lead you to a pretty big mess in your apartment. So you have to look at the cost. So, as an example, in the third category, so those were the first two. In the third category, let's look at emergency response. In 2021, Haiti was hit by a 7.2 magnitude earthquake that killed 2,000 people and injured 13,000 others. In most large-scale emergencies today, people post a lot of information in social media and in public websites, and there's a lot of public data. AI is extremely powerful in detecting important information, filtering out all of that noise. In spite of that, first responders, emergency management organizations have to look at that information and make decisions. It's not easy, even if you have an AI system that supports filtering out a lot of that noise. To give you an example, if you're a firefighter, imagine that for a second, and you reach this scene, what would you do initially? Some of you will run away, that may be the right answer, but if you're trained in firefighting, the first thing you do is analyze the situation. You're going to look at every factor that might impact how you react. In emergency training, this is called size up. It's a systematic evaluation of the information as it comes in, in addition to personal observations. In a fire situation, and most emergency situations include things like, what is the type of structure? What is the weather? What is the time of day? Are there people inside the building? What is the situation on the street? And so you get the idea, right? Looking at all of these factors, they make a decision so that they don't deploy the wrong resources or so they know exactly where to deploy the resources. We can do a similar thing when we're dealing with information on a daily basis, and we should, and we have to. We don't really have a choice. And we do this in what I call SAFER, the SAFER framework. So the idea is you get a piece of information, whatever that is, so it has a source, and so you start questioning the source. Is it a reliable source? Am I familiar with the source? Is the source reliable and trustworthy in the specific topic that is providing me the information? Then you look at the facts provided by that piece of information that you're receiving. Do they contradict any known facts? Are there new things, new statements that you're not aware of? And if that's the case, you cross-reference. This means, can you find evidence elsewhere of what you're seeing? And we can all use this everywhere. And if you think about it, it's applicable every time you're seeing information, whether it's social media, whether you're searching the web, whether you're in emergency response. Now, the AI thinking wheel works because it relates to how AI works. So how does AI work? In essence, there are two categories of AI. There's generative AI and there's predictive AI. So generative AI generates content. Many of the images that you see in the presentation, so examples include very natural-looking images, artworks, fake people. Predictive AI, and text, of course. Predictive AI labels things. That's the simplest way of looking at it. So you take an input, produces a label for that input. In this example, it can take images of skin cells and predict cancer with accuracy that's so close to human experts. 
many, many applications of this, right? So those are the two categories. Let's look at an example. So if I give you this sentence, I don't understand anything, it's all blank to me, you're probably able to fill in the blank. If it's English, you would probably say, it's all Greek to me. In Greek, you'd say, it's all Chinese to me. In Italian, you'd say, it's all Arabic to me. And in Cantonese, you'd say, it's all chicken intestines to me. And so notice something, you were able to predict what to fill in because you've heard this before many, many times. You're trained, you've collected data, you've learned a pattern. AI basically does the same thing. So you were not able to do the, maybe the, um, the Cantonese one if you don't speak Cantonese. But you were able to do the Italian one, most of you, I'm assuming, right? The same thing happens with AI. AI may be trained with one language, but it doesn't understand another language. It doesn't understand the stuff it has never seen. Furthermore, it doesn't understand context. It doesn't understand cultural differences. So it's very primitive, but it's very powerful because it can be applied in very specific areas and specific fields. So we have to be aware of how it works and the mistakes that it can make. And it can make many mistakes. We're really at a point where we need to interact and think about how these systems work and be aware that every interaction that we have with our social media platforms, with our search systems, with our phones, is teaching these AI systems more about us. And so we're feeding them, and we have to get better at doing this. We have to apply the wheel constantly. Technology is advancing at a pace that we've never seen before. Innovation is accelerating at an exponential pace. The changes, even for us in the technical research community, those of us that are writing the papers that are being published in the top conferences, it's hard to keep up because there's so much innovation happening. And we're not even really aware of the consequences of what, what's getting out there before we see the next thing. So what this means is, if we compare it to our past, in the past we had plenty of time to adapt to new technologies, to evaluate, to think, to create new policies. We don't anymore. We have to act and we have to act right now. The future is very, very bright with AI and it's real, but we really have to be proactive. We cannot just lay back and relax. Keep your hands on the wheel. Thank you.